Okay, so uh, like I just said, today we're going to be talking about uh, excavations at uh, the Jamestown Tribe Picnic Site, which is the name that we gave uh, this archaeological site. The Smithsonian Trinomial or archaeological site number is 45CA778, um, and that simply means that uh, 45 is the designee for the state of Washington, CA is Clallam County, and 778 means that it's uh, the 778th archaeological site recorded in Clallam County. Um, so uh, we're going to we're gonna dive more into some of these images uh, as we go through, but um, what I would ask is that uh, if anybody has questions, you can either go ahead and type those in the chat box at the bottom or save them till the end of the presentation. And I'll make sure that we have uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end um, to answer those questions. Um, so uh, giving a little bit of uh, historic background and ethnographic accounts of Swim Bay. Uh, in 1790, Manuel Quimper, who was a ex uh, Spanish explorer, uh, exploring on behalf of the Spanish crown, sailed into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And you can see from the map on the right side of the screen, which was created by that ex expedition, that uh, the farthest east that they made it into the Strait of Juan de Fuca is actually the uh, is Discovery Bay. That's the bay that you're seeing outlined there. Um, if you look just to the left of Discovery Bay, you can see a little inlet, and that's the mouth to Squim Bay. So they didn't actually go into Squim Bay, and you can see a small cross just to the west of Squim Bay. So like I was saying, they, they didn't actually sail all the way into Squim Bay. You can see the outline of Dungeness Spit and Dungeness Bay, and then just to the east of that is a cross that the Spaniards erected somewhere in the area of Grays Marsh Farms today. Uh, and actually claimed that land for Spain, um, sailed just around the entrance of Squim Bay, but didn't sail into Squim Bay. And then they did sail into Discovery Bay. And that's where we get these really great accounts of uh, canoes full of squalum uh, coming out with fish, shellfish, uh, venison, most likely elk, uh, elk venison, uh, woolen blankets that would have been woven from uh, dog hair from the Coast Salish wool dogs. Um, so you can see the outline of Discovery Bay is actually pretty clearly made. Um, and the, the Quimper expedition actually spent a couple of days in Discovery Bay. Uh, they were pretty happy to trade for some fresh fish and venison. Um, they also got uh, berries, mats, skins, uh, so a lot of uh, pretty friendly trading going on between the Spaniards and the Squalum on Discovery Bay. And that's sort of the earliest ethnographic accounts we have of European and uh, Squalum interactions. Um, next to sail into the area that we're aware of was George Vancouver in 1792. Um, these images are actually not from Squimmer uh, Dungeness Bay. The image on the left side of your screen are duck poles erected um, just north of Port Townsend towards the Fort Warden area. And then the image on the right side of your screen is actually looking um, from what used to be a spit is now Rat Island looking south through Killisset Harbor towards Mount Rainier. Um, but we use these images because they're, they're fairly representative of what Vancouver also found on Dungeness, uh, Squim and Discovery Bays. Uh, almost every single spit that was near a village site would have had these duck poles erected. And uh, each family actually owned a pair of duck poles that they were responsible for maintaining. And they would weave uh, massive nets that usually measured anywhere from like 100 feet across by 40 feet tall out of nettle fiber twine. And during our annual waterfowl migrations, they would pull those nets up between the post and then they would send somebody out in a canoe uh, who would paddle out around the waterfowl and scare them up off the water, um, usually around sunrise or sunset when they were uh, settling down to roost. Uh, the waterfowl would all fly across the spit, they would hit the nets, you could drop the nets and then you'd have hundreds or thousands of ducks that you could um, salt and smoke and preserve for winter, have a feast, a really great uh, and regular food source. Um, also from the Vancouver account in 1792, uh, they talked about actually paddling around the interior of Squim Bay, 
uh, attempting to shoot waterfowl, but uh, <laughs> no matter how many times they shot at them, they were unable to reach them with their guns, although they made many attempts. Um, Vancouver also noted a few of the natives in two or three canoes uh, favored them with their companionship and brought them some fish and venison. And he also noted in that account that um, the Squalum were uh, pretty indifferent to the, the English ship. So it's a pretty good indicator that uh, they had probably had a, a couple interactions with European explorers at this point beyond just these two accounts that we have from Vancouver and Quimper. Um, there would have been uh, a lot of different traders coming up into the area by then and exploring the area that we have possibly just don't have written accounts of. Uh, much more specific to Squim Bay and the Squalum of Squim Bay are Erna Gunther's uh, accounts when she came out to the Olympic Peninsula in the 1920s and interviewed some Squalum ancestors about their memories of uh, village life in the 1880s, uh, right around before those uh, villages sort of disappeared and those folks moved over to the new Jamestown uh, village site. And uh, specifically from Chiquing, which was the village uh, at Washington Harbor at the north end of Squim Bay, were um, the ancestors Robert Collier from the Collier family, family uh, Mary Hall Hunter Wood from the Hall family, and John Cook. Um, they were all from Chiquing. Um, Mary Hall was actually from Discovery Bay, uh, along with Lily Johnson, the wife of Joe Johnson, and they both moved to Chiquing and then later on moved up to uh, Jamestown. And from those accounts, we actually have very specific references to uh, resource harvesting locations, techniques, um, landscape management, uh, some really, really interesting data that we were able to dive into. Um, these are just a few of the more interesting ones. John Cook's grandfather would actually paddle out to Protection Island, and there's a specific area where uh, the seals and sea lions pull out and rest on the rocks. He knew where that spot was. And so he would actually weave a noose out of cedar and would lay that uh, in the water where the seals jump in. And then he would go around, uh, scare the seal to jump through that noose and then actually wrangle it into shore and club it. So you can imagine the, the levels of knowledge, um, at not only knowledge, but actually, you know, uh, strength to be able to haul in a seal on a cedar rope. Um, that, that's no easy undertaking. Um, Protection Island was also a great source for seagull eggs and other waterfowl eggs. Uh, women would go out there with baskets and spend an afternoon harvesting hundreds of sea fowl eggs. Um, and a very interesting note on that is we know um, from later ethnic, ethnographic accounts um, later on in the 20th century that uh, as seagulls specifically um, became uh, introduced to modern waste and refuse and landfills and that sort of thing, that it basically ruined the taste of seagulls. And that's when that um, practice of eating seagull eggs went out of fashion. Uh, there is also an interesting account of a whale that made a very poor uh, right turn into the Washington Harbor Lagoon. Uh, the folks in the village saw the whale out there and immediately grabbed their spears and harpoons and went out and captured it. Uh, and that, that's pretty in indicative of uh, what would have happened at most Slalom village sites, you know, the, the opportunistic hunting of um, any large mammals that would have come within reach. Uh, it, it, it's easy food. Um, a whale is enough, uh, usually big enough to provide sustenance for, for months. So um, would have been a really great uh, uh, boost, especially going into winter. Um, inside Squim Bay itself, uh, every year there's a big uh, spawning of herring that come in. Um, and so they would uh, paddle out with the canoes and they actually used a tool called a herring rake, which looks a little bit like a, uh, a short garden rake. So it, um, you know, you've got a long handle and then a cross spoke. And then they would actually use uh, these bone spikes that were uh, two to three inches long across the handle of that and you would rake that broom through the water and it would actually impale the herring on the spikes. And then you would pull that into the canoe, tap it off, the fish would fall off. And um, that's still a practice that um, some tribes engage in traditionally in the, along the Northwest coast. Um, they would also harvest herring eggs. Um, you can do that by putting hemlock or other uh, conifer branches, soaking them in the water and the herring actually attach their clumps of eggs to those branches. 
and then you can pull those back out into the canoe. Um, and that was a, a very important delicacy. Um, one really interesting specific account we have to Blinn was that uh, the chief at Chiquing, the village at Washington Harbor, owned the fishing rights to the fish trap that was on Jimmy Come Lately Creek, where there's a run of uh, coho and chum salmon. Um, when he wasn't using that fish trap or his family wasn't using that fish trap, for example, at night, um, other families would be given the right to harvest out of it. And while the men were uh, fishing on the fish traps, the women were busy gathering uh, our native Pacific blackberries on a burnt out prairie patch there in Blinn, um, probably right around the area where the Seven Cedars Casino is today. Um, and then they were also gathering clams, and that's related to what we're going to talk about today, sort of the archaeological evidence of the mass processing of those shellfish at the head of Squim Bay. Um, at Washington Harbor, the main thing was the tukum, so they asked the chief there about making it. Uh, tukum, that's the name of the duck nets or duck poles, and those would have been out on uh, both Gibson and probably Travis Spit as well. And there were actually 10 uh, pairs of poles for the Chiguing village site, which is to match the um, 10 families that lived there and the 10 longhouses. So kind of gives you a way, uh, an idea of how uh, resources were apportioned within the village. So uh, sort of a timeline of how uh, these excavations came about. Uh, the Jamestown tribe had actually been planning a veterans memorial for a couple of years. Uh, and the decision was to construct that just to the northeast of the tribe's administration building in Blinn. Um, that property had formerly been a single family residence that the tribe had purchased um, back in the, the 1980s, um, had been converted to um, trust and reservation land uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, construction started in earnest in early 2018. Uh, probably around April or May, uh, and during a uh, site visit, I noticed some patches of exposed shell midden. Um, we had conducted an archaeological survey before the project began, but uh, unfortunately did not test right up along the shoreline, and this that's where the, the site turned out to be. So um, in early July, we went ahead and called a um, work stoppage on the project, uh, we called in a professional archaeologist from Willamette Cultural Resources in uh, Seattle to come out and help uh, help us figure out sort of the lateral extent of the site, um, as well as how, how deep it was and give us some idea of um, exactly what we were dealing with out there. Um, we began uh, those investigations in early August of 2018. Um, by the first week of uh, the end of the first week of August, we had an excavation plan approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs because it was reservation land um, through the oversight agency. And then uh, from mid-August through September 4th of 2018, we conducted excavations at the site. Um, and uh, I know that was a pretty long time ago, but if, if you remember back in 2018, that was the exact two-week span where it was just like smoggy, super brown smoke the entire time. So you'll see possibly in some of the backgrounds of this picture, um, the sky just looks dirty, dirty brown. And that's because we were all kind of ensconced in the, the smoke from the wildfires that month. Um, so these are some of the, the excavation features that we ended up finding. Uh, essentially, what we found was uh, probably somewhere between 15 to 18 Coast Salish cook pits. Um, and I say Coast Salish because this wasn't something specific to just the Squalum tribe, but um, tribes throughout uh, the Salish Sea, Puget Sound region, um, use these uh, roasting pits, these cooking pits for um, everything from shellfish to camas and other lily bulbs um, and the, the processing of root products. Um, these are uh, specifically shellfish cooking pits. And uh, what they would do is excavate a pit, um, usually somewhere around a half meter to a meter wide by a half meter to a meter deep, depending on how much material you were gonna cook. Uh, you would walk around the beach and you would gather up beach cobbles that are roughly around fist sized um, to maybe grapefruit sized. Um, you're going to gather up a bunch of those rocks, you put them down in the bottom of the pit, and then you light a fire on top of them. You let that fire burn for an hour or two, let it burn down to ashes, 
you brush those ashes off the rocks and then you can put your uh, shellfish in the pit and then you're going to cover it with some sort of vegetative material, um, skunk cabbage leaves, cedar bows, um, sword ferns are a couple of the ones mentioned in ethnographic texts. Uh, cover those up and let it steam for an hour or two, depending on how much you have in there. Uncover that vegetative material and all of your clams or oysters or what have you are perfectly cooked. Um, then you can uh, take it a step further um, and you can actually smoke those clams or oysters if you want to preserve them for uh, late winter. So if you look at these images, what you're seeing here is um, some cook pits that are excavated to different depths. You can see in certain patches, there's, uh, you can see, well, the black charcoal, and then you can see sort of bright red to burnt orange um, oxidized patches and burnt rocks from the fire burning there um, at high temperatures. And then the white stuff that you see is uh, fragments of marine shell, um, billions and billions and billions of tiny fragments of oyster shell, which is very friable and breaks up um, almost into sand when it's cooked. Uh, and then bigger chunks of uh, butter clam and horse clam and cockle and little neck clam shells, which are a bit thicker, um, tougher, and, and survive a bit longer in those contexts. Um, th these, you, this, uh, this feature specifically, the unit F1 cook pit feature, um, is of note because we got uh, one of our uh, radiocarbon dates from the very base level of this feature. And then our other radiocarbon date came from a, a cook pit feature in unit H1, about a meter and a half over. Uh, so uh, another thing, I, I'm talking about how they, they used these rocks to cook. Uh, what we call these rocks in archaeological terms is uh, FMR, fire modified rock, or FCR, fire cracked rock. Um, and this little graphic in the bottom left just gives you an idea of the number of fire modified rocks that we we're finding in each of these units um, at the different levels. And these levels, you know, level one, level two, level three, these are excavated in 10 centimeter increments. So you can see um, in unit F, F1 level two, just within 10 centimeters, we had 259 pieces of fire modified rock. So um, in some of these areas, we had some really intensive um, and, and long-term shellfish processing activities going on. Uh, if you look at the image in the bottom right corner of your screen, I've circled in red uh, one rock that's kind of hard to discern it from the others. But if you look at the, the blown up picture, you can actually see that this cobble has been flaked. And if you, it's, it's roughly a little bit uh, larger than your fist, but it fits perfectly. And if you were to hold it uh, up to the light, you'd see that it's basically, it has five flakes knocked off of this cobble. It fits perfectly in the palm of your hand with that nice blade edge down. And that would have been your shovel that you would use to excavate the pit itself. So um, basically there in unit J, uh, what we found was they excavated the pit. They had a, some sort of cooking activities. And then they tossed the, the modified cobble that they used to excavate the pit on top of the rocks just to be another um, fire modified rock, but it's not burnt. Um, so I mentioned radiocarbon dates. Uh, what was really, really interesting from this site was uh, both of the radiocarbon dates that we got back uh, date back close to or over a thousand years before present. Um, so years before present is an archaeological term that's based on the use of uh, C-14 uh, radiocarbon dating that began in 1950. So when we say before present, it's important to know that present is 1950. Um, so really, you're, you're adding roughly 70 years on to these dates. Um, but to show that, that we've got um, extensive usage of this area for shellfish processing by the Swalom and their ancestors. Um, this date, roughly a thousand years before present, is roughly comparable to some of the other dates that we get on sites um, on, you know, a, a sort of just above the beach terrace around Squim Bay, um, over at Pit Ship Point where John Wayne Marina is today. Uh, the shell midden there had uh, radiocarbon dates up on an upper terrace going back just over 2,000 years before present, which makes it one of the older shell middens um, on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, 
But the reason we don't see radiocarbon dates generally older than one to 2000 years in our area um, is simply because that's, that's roughly how long ago our, our sea level stabilized. So our, our sea level has been roughly stable for the last two to 3000 years. If you went back um, 8,000 years to 10,000 years, Squim Bay would have actually been um, basically a, a valley with probably a small pond or a lake in it that then drained out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and at that time, the Dungeness River actually th flowed through the Bell Creek Channel out through Washington Harbor and into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So there actually would have been a river valley um, and an estuary somewhere just north of the mouth of Squim Bay. Um, out, out in that area. So the sea level 8,000 to 10,000 years ago um, was hundreds of feet lower than it is today. Um, there's other factors, you know, not only um, the end of the last ice age and, and sea level rise um, resulting from um, the influx of more fresh water into the oceans, but also the isostatic rebound on the Olympic Peninsula as those ice sheets retreated north um, the weight, you know, the, the ice sheets, uh, 14,000 years ago, there was a mile thick ice sheet here in Squim, uh, Squim Bay area. And so that was an enormous amount of weight resting on the crust of the earth. And after that ice sheet retreated north, um, there was almost immediate what's called isostatic rebound, which is um, different areas of the crust start rebounding or pushing back up since they don't have that ice pushing down on them. And it gets really interesting when we look at sites around Squim Bay, um, because we can actually see that, um, for example, at Pitt Ship Point or John Wayne Marina, there are components of Shell Midden in an archaeological site that are out below the, the tide line, below the, the low, low water line. And those date back probably 350 to 400 years ago. That was a village site that was on a beach terrace. There was a local subsidence event that actually sank that site down below the tide line. And so folks would have packed up and moved to another village site, probably the Chiquing village site, which we know first started to be occupied around 600 years before present um, and then built up as a village since then. So that's just to give you sort of a, a framework for it, not just the different um, environmental, but also geological factors that we're playing in over these extensive time scales that the Squalum and their ancestors have been on this landscape. Um, so a couple of the really cool artifacts that we recovered from the site. Uh, the two images on your top are an elk antler wood splitting wedge that we found. Um, where we can pretty safely assume that it's elk just by the size of the, the wedge itself. It's almost a foot long. Um, it, it's pretty large, and this would have been used for woodworking activities and most specifically uh, carving western red cedar, uh, which splits straight down the grain. So you can use an elk antler wedge like this and a, a hammer stone or a hand maul, which is a, a nicely carved stone that fits in your hand and has a platform on the bottom that you can use to drive the elk antler wedge down through the wood and, and split off nice straight grain planks for your longhouse. You can use it to um, start carving a, a canoe, um, whatever you wanna do. Uh, what's really cool about this is we found additional woodworking evidence um, in the lithic artifacts or stone artifacts in the, the bottom right image. You can see there at the very bottom is uh, a nephrite adze blade. Nephrite is actually a form of jade that's found, um, there's a vein of it that runs north south through the Cascade Mountains um, from Washington State all the way up through British Columbia. Um, it was an incredibly important uh, tool, uh, tool material for the tribes of Pacific Northwest. Um, it's one of the hardest types of, of native stone that we have here. Um, there is, there are sources of obsidian, but those are much farther away. Um, we do occasionally find obsidian at sites on the Olympic Peninsula, um, but those pieces have been sourced from as far away as obsidian cliffs in Oregon, which is something like 400 miles away, um, versus nephrite, which is available from as close as the Stillaguamish and Skagit Valleys, um, would have been traded from the, the Cascade Mountain tribes out through um, the Salish Sea to tribes out here uh, on the Olympic Peninsula. The small flake that you see, oh, and, and one more note about the nephrite adze blade, um, that would have been hafted to 
a U wood handle. Um, and if you actually went to the, the Jamestown tribes carving shed today, you would see them using almost an identical tool um, that just uses a steel blade instead of a nephrite adze blade, but, but the same exact size and, and shape as um, what you see there. And if you take a really close look at uh, the Jamestown tribe totem poles or any of the carvings around the tribal campus, um, if you take a really close look or actually run your hand across the wood, you can feel the little chips that come out of the wood and that's from using that little motion um, and, and you can use these ads to do some really delicate carving and that's where you get that really uh, those really beautiful artistic forms in the in the Northwest um, Coast Salish uh, wood carving art. Um, the small flake just to the left of that is a material that's called dacite which is another stone that was incredibly important for tools. Uh, Daysite was actually imported to the Olympic Peninsula by the, uh, the glaciers during the last ice age. It, it, the original source is Mount Garibaldi up in British Columbia. So cobbles of daysite were pushed down here by the glaciers. Um, when the ice sheets melted, they deposited these cobbles all over the landscape. landscape. Um, slowly, these cobbles, you know, they end up getting washed down or exposed in the gravel bars in the river. So uh, you can still go down to the Dungeness River gravel bar. And if you really know what you're looking for, you can find day site cobbles today. Um, so these kind of would have been, in, in, you know, uh, found in those gravel bars. And then we actually find them like at the Swim Bypass site and other archaeological sites. You would collect a couple of those cobbles and keep them at the camper village site and flake those into stone tools um, whenever you needed them. Something this small, um, you know, you would, you would start with a big cobble, you would flake that into, um, say, an arrowhead, a harpoon point, um, or, or a big chopper like what you see here. And as you're doing that, small flakes come off, what's called debit, debitage or waste flakes. Um, and this small flake probably originated as debitage, but even those small waste flakes like this one have a razor sharp edge on them. So this could have been used as a small handheld razor blade for doing things like um, cutting sinew off of bone. Uh, elk and deer sinews were used for uh, thread for tying and hafting um, tools, weapons, what have you. Um, could have been used for um, helping flay a fish and delicate tasks like that. Um, in the bottom left corner, you can see that we've actually got uh, couple pieces of unidentified mammal bone, possibly uh, deer bone. And you can see some cut marks on there from those processing activities that I just mentioned uh, that they would have used that day site flake for. Oh, so here on the, the top left, you can see some example of ads blades. Um, these, are, these are actually um, hafted a little bit different than what I was describing. So there's a, there's a couple different ways that you can use them. Um, but you can see in the bottom left corner, they, there's actually some really beautiful um, and actually massive ads blades out there um, in different museum collections. Some of the largest that I've seen in research, they, they measure uh, up to a, a foot long. And those were probably more ceremonial in purpose and, and sort of um, designating status more than um, actually being used for carving of wood. And for some reason, the image in the middle of the screen moved over across the map. Um, but what you would see in the map that's behind the image uh, is simply showing that vein of day site that runs um, north south from uh, roughly about halfway up through British Columbia, Cascade Mountains down um, to roughly east of Seattle. We found hundreds of pieces of faunal bone, of animal bone, um, we found a, a couple pieces of seal bone, um, which isn't very surprising. There's, there's still seals, a, a healthy seal population in Squim Bay today. Um, seals would have been harvested not just for their meat, but seal grease was an incredibly important resource, um, would have been uh, kept, uh, uh, rendered down and then kept sealed in a bentwood box or um, some other type of container and kept for winter. And then actually seal grease was usually in winter time, a common meal was something like seal grease mixed with um, dried or preserved berries. So you get a nice mix of um, high calorie animal fat, and then you also get vitamin C um, and other important nutrients from uh, the, the berries. So even at, at, at uh, 
that time, a very savvy knowledge of the, the necessity of nutrition in late winter. Uh, and that's actually why you see um, such advanced technological and cultural development amongst Pacific Northwest tribes, even though they weren't quote unquote um, agrarian agricultural uh, communities was because they were so good at preserving uh, resources and specifically food for late winter. Um, and then they could spend their late winter season, instead of worrying about food, you spent late winter um, going through your ceremonial and spiritual um, side of life and sort of uh, focusing on your community and, and artwork and that sort of stuff. Um, we also found uh, more pieces of elk antler that uh, we couldn't really tell if it had been used. Uh, we found uh, deer ulnas. We did find some fish bone, um, spiny dogfish vertebrae. We found some vertebrae from flatfish, probably flounder. Uh, we did find some bird bone, uh, probably from some species of duck. So again, a, a little bit of anything that would have wandered by the campsite while they were um, primarily processing shellfish. Um, one of the really interesting things that we found at this site was a large number of Olympia oysters. So uh, Olympia oysters, we, we know that they were out here, we know that they were on the landscape, but for whatever reason, they're not very well represented in the archaeological record. Um, there could be a couple different reasons for that. My strongest suspicion is it has to do with just um, the friability or the, the thinness of the shells that I mentioned earlier. Um, Olympia oysters, they're much smaller than Pacific oysters, their shells are thinner than Pacific oysters, um, and especially if you apply heat, like in a, a Coast Salish cooking pit, um, those shells just, they, they turn to dust almost the minute that you touch them. So um, it makes sense that at most sites where uh, Olympia oyster would have been processed or cooked, that most of that shell would have just disappeared over the years and, and just turned into sand. Um, however, for whatever reason, we were lucky enough at this site to find um, actual lenses two to three inches thick uh, within these, these cook pit features of just Olympia oyster shell. So uh, the, the pie graph is just showing you sort of the, the different shellfish species that we found. And you can see that 80% of the shellfish was Olympia oyster butter clams. Um, and then a little smattering of anything else that they would have found out there sort of um, opportunistically while they were gathering those. Um, and, and to note, you know, you harvest butter clams in a very different way that you, than you do Olympia oysters. So those were two different harvesting activities going on. Um, butter clams, you have to go out and dig the clam. The Olympia oysters actually would have been um, living out on oyster bars out on the head of the bay. And the Jamestown tribe is actually working um, today to reestablish those Olympia oyster um, populations out on Squim Bay. Um, and, and so we've learned some interesting things. If you go out on Squim Bay today, except for the areas where that those restoration projects are occurring, um, if you look at the head of Squim Bay on a, on a low, low tide, you see an extensive mud flat. Um, however, if you go out there and actually dig down through that mud a couple inches, what you find is a nice, beautiful, pebbly, cobbly beach underneath. And most of that mud is probably a result of logging and development that's occurred just over the last 150 years. So um, what happened to the Olympia oyster was twofold. Um, you had sort of the environmental degradation that was happening upland, which causes a lot of silt and mud to start running downstream and get deposited um, over those oyster beds. Um, Olympia oysters were also uh, heavily exploited in the late 1800 and early 1900s for their commercial value. Um, ships would sail up from San Francisco um, into Grays Harbor or into Squim Bay or dis uh, also at the head of Discovery Bay were large oyster bars. Um, they would send out longboats with big pry bars and they would pry up big masses of these oysters they would put them in the hold of the ship in a box of seawater, and you could transport those back down to San Francisco. The oysters would still be alive and you could sell them wholesale at the market there. Um, so that, that's basically where the Olympia oysters disappeared to. Um, we also, uh, just a, a note on the left side of the screen there is kind of giving you an idea by um, faunal weight, uh, roughly, you know, 90% of what we found in faunal bone was either deer elk bone. 
Um, like I mentioned, a little bit of seal and then a, a teeny bit of bird and fish. And that leads us to the conclusion that um, this archaeological site was a seasonal squalum encampment used for resource gathering and preservation, especially the harvesting and processing of shellfish, with a primary focus on butter clams and Olympia oysters. Um, the earliest occupations that we were able to date at this site occurred at least 1,100 years before present. Um, and, and we've actually, oh, and so why the Jamestown picnic site? Uh, the Quenseyu annual picnic that the Jamestown tribe does is their uh, community gathering every summer occurs about 30 yards to the south of this archaeological site. And you can see from these photos that the exact same uh, traditional Coast Salish cooking techniques are used today, um, with the exception of instead of using uh, vegetative material to cover the cook pit, um, they use newspapers today. Uh, so a little tongue in cheek, but uh, it, it kind of made sense to, to name it the Jamestown picnic site just because that event has apparently been going on for something like a thousand years um, that we now know of. Um, one of the other really interesting things before I wrap up that we're uh, able to do from this site is actually using those Olympia oyster shells. Uh, we've been working with researchers from the University of Washington um, to actually, we basically gave them a batch of the um, Olympia oyster shells that we dated back, you know, a thousand years before present. And they're actually able to use those uh, oyster shells. They, they measure the thickness of them and use them to compare that to Olympia oyster shells today um, and get an idea from the thickness of their shells, how ocean, ocean uh, excuse me, ocean acidification um, may be impacting those populations. So just one cool note about how we're sort of tying that in with um, contemporary marine biology and, and, and resource um, data. So um, these are a couple of the sources that I pulled uh, material and data from for this presentation. And these are all available in the Jamestown Squalum Tribal Library. Um, we are recording these presentations and they're being made available uh, for free on the Jamestown's uh, Tribal Library YouTube page. So if you get on youtube.com and search for JST Library, uh, you can find this and uh, uh, dozens of other videos that we've put together um, covering different facets of uh, tribal history and culture. Uh, you can also visit library.jamestowntribe.org for more research, uh, research resources. Um, there's different tabs at the, the top of that page. Um, you can see one's called research, and if you go down and you, there's a lot of cool information you can poke through in there. Um, tribalmuseum.jamestown, oh, that should be jamestowntribe.org, is the House of Seven Generations Online Museum, which has some really great photograph, photographic collections, um, archival collections from Jamestown Spalum Tribe history. Um, you can also visit the North Olympic History Center's website, northolympichistory.org. Um, we're currently working on um, getting a bunch of new materials up on our website and implementing um, our what we're calling our cloud project, which is basically creating our own uh, online virtual museum that should hopefully be going live here in um, the next couple months. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you're interested in more of these programs, please consider becoming a member of the North Olympic History Center. Uh, we will be making announcement in the next two or three weeks regarding our 2021 presentation series that we'll again, again be doing in partnership uh, with the North Olympic History Center and the Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Our theme for 2021 is going to be learning our landscape, and we're going to be um, incorporating not just history, but um, marine biology, um, a bunch of different uh, Western sciences, along with traditional ecological knowledge, um, to give us a better rounded understanding of the, the landscape of the North Olympic Peninsula, um, where what, what's happened in the past and sort of where we're going tomorrow. Um, so we're really excited. We're, we're putting together a list of uh, speakers and topics, and uh, please keep your eye out for that coming soon.